I w- I'm again would go back to the logical domain. So. Uh, no, 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 no. Let's not go back. No, right. <laughs> like, okay, I can grant. Like, let's just grant the classical logic. I, I, I'll just grant that. Let's stick with this moral point. Like, no, I, but no, but you grant. You grant that there are biases in the logical domain that we are evolutionarily brought to. I wanted to debate Kane on moral realism, but I'm not. Uh, 100% sold on my position. Actually, I'm not even that keen on it emotionally. I ju- it just seems to be something I rationally reached. And um, of course, having a STEM background, maybe that's what led me there. <laughs> I-, I think this is going to be be nice. So, so first off, I think the first question that I mm, I'm curious about, and I think is relevant for the, for this debate, is are you um. And uh, a metaphysical anti-realist. So that's what that's a position that um, mm, objects in the world are not mind independent. So anti-realist, metaphysical anti-realists deny that the world is mind independent. Um, yeah, in in some sense, I am. Um, but I tend, in the context of like talking about metaethics, to sort of bracket that and. Um, just because I, I I think it's one of those things where like you know when it, whenever you engage in philosophical debates it's sort of easy to just kind of undermine the whole debate by like rejecting a load of the premises and then it, it just seems less interesting in in a way you know so it's like there is some sense in which I think I would be uh, a metaphysical anti-realist as as you've defined it um, I, I I have to be a little bit careful how I frame that though because what, what I would want to say is that, um, you know, the so I, I think that what objects there are um, are sort of dependent on our means of classification. I don't think that means of classification are like given by the world. I think that we construct them. Um, would that mean that they're not mind independent? Well, obviously, our best models of the world um, do, in fact, draw a distinction between uh, mind and not mind, right? So in, in that sense, like from within the model, there are certainly mind independent objects. Um, but I, I, again, like I, I don't know if, if that's just going to completely undermine the whole debate <laughs> and, and we can bracket it. <laughs> you know? No, I, yeah, I actually think, I actually think it might because, um, so how, how would, uh, a moral naturalist ever be able to overcome somebody that's, I mean, I, I can't convince somebody that's a metaphysical anti-realist, or can I, if I'm a moral naturalist? Right, so I think that you might be able to, because, um, so, okay, there are lots of things that, you know, I'm, I'm, there are lots of objects and processes and properties that I'm going to say, yeah, like, I believe in, in that stuff. So if you say to me, you know, well, there are pleasures and pains, um, yeah, of course there are pleasures and pains. If you say, like, there are people, there are societies, um, there are particular things that societies can do to promote the flourishing of their members, you know, there are particular types of rules that if everybody were to follow them, um, that would, like, pr- promote peace and cooperation. Like, y- yes, right? Now, of course, um, I can kind of step back from that and then I can say, all right, so these... Um, you know, these, these like distinctions when I'm sort of drawing distinctions between, you know, pleasures and pains and, you know, the way that I sort of carve up reality, um, that's, uh, uh, like, I'm going to take a, at least an anti-realist line on that, you know, on the, on, on sort of classifications and classification and kinds. Um, I mean, maybe one way to put it is I don't think there are natural kinds, but, um, I mean, obviously mm-hmm. I'm like, it's it's not as though I'm unable to talk about stuff. Obviously, I do. I have I have lots of beliefs about the way the world is. Um, it's just that I will adopt a uh, a kind of relativist or constructivist account of them. Um, but that, I don't see why that would matter because I, I mean that I still have beliefs about the way the world is, and presumably that I still share at least some of them with you. Okay. 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 So I think, yeah, so it, this was just an introductory question, let's say. Um, I'm really not that hung up on it, but I was just wondering. So, so maybe I can describe, um, I can describe my kind of moral naturalist I've reached. Um, starting from saying, so 
Mm, we humans are biological organisms, I would say. And um, as biological organisms, limited finite biological organisms, we are subject to some laws. Um, so, for instance, we can't see we can't see in four dimensions, and we can't see the full the full spectrum of colors. And mm, it seems to me too that even our thoughts uh, are, go are governed by some laws in some sense, because. Um, for example, we can't think of something, we can't picture something that is both A and not A. So, um, and I think this is to be expected for any kind of biological organisms that they would be kind of guided by some some rules. And so, uh, taking this line, I would say, for instance, we even have some um, beliefs that are instilled in us uh, from the fact that we are humans. For example, uh, I would say, f for instance, that we um, believe uh, that we ought to follow the law of non-contradiction when we speak. Maybe you can say. Maybe yeah. Maybe we can stop yeah, here. I, I don't. I don't believe that. Um, and I, I. I. Sorry. Let me clarify. Yeah. yeah. Um, I. Li I literally don't believe that we ought to follow the law of non-contradiction. I also would say that. Um, so, I mean, there are some people who. Uh, this maybe is a problem for that specific example, right? So, um, uh, I, I get the general point that you're making. With respect to that specific example, though, and this maybe does pose a problem for the general point, because, you know, there's a long history of, like, philosophers um, pointing to things that they think are um, just kind of, like, you know, analytic, a priori, you know, we, we, we just, like, it's kind of built into the way that we conceive of the world, you know, so one thing that's built into us is this law of non-contradiction. And and then it turns out, actually, there's loads of philosophers who've just straight up denied it. I mean, you know, there's... The, I, I think, actually, in the um, recent Phil Paper survey, 12% endorsed true yeah. contradictions. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, like, that's... That's actually quite a lot. Yeah, um, OK. That's a significant number of people just coming out and saying, like, yeah, I think there are true contradictions. Um, and honestly, you know, dialetheism... Uh, Dialetheism is the view that there are true contradictions. Yeah. Seems pretty plausible to me. Um, now, um, it, but, it, but, here's, but the, the more general point, though, is e even if, again, even if I, like, bracket that and I say, okay, let's just assume classical logic. And let's assume that, like, everybody accepts classical logic. So everybody denies... You're already granting a lot of things to me. <laughs> Sorry, you're let, you're already granting a lot of things to me. You already granted two things. Okay, okay, go on. Yeah, go on. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is kind of it's, yeah. this is an important point. Is that um, I I don't uh, I don't think that there are um, epistemic orts or like you know like logical orts. So when you say well like you you ought to follow the law of non contradiction, mm -hmm. well you know that's always going to have reference to um, like people's desires and goals if I'm making an ought claim. So I can say, you know, we're both engaging in inquiry. I assume that we, uh, we want to have, you know, true beliefs and we want to minimize false beliefs. Um, and so then I can say, well, you know, it, like maybe in that sense, you know, you ought to, uh, you, you know, you ought to follow these, these logical rules. Um, but if you're, if you're, if you're just sort of like giving that as like, yeah, you know, without reference to people's desires and goals, then yeah, that that just doesn't make any that doesn't make any sense to me. I I don't really know what that means. Um, okay, so maybe I can try to. So first, let's say we we weed out all the self-referential cases. So for instance, I can maybe grant something back and say I I can accept the Dalitius view that when when we are talking about self-referential statements and in some specific cases, um then we don't have a necessary belief to follow the law of non-contradiction. So maybe I'll just, uh, I, I, I can grant that. And then um, it just, it seems to me that, um, uh, so maybe I should be a bit more precise when I, when I talk. So I think there's um, a law that governs us that um, makes it so we necessarily believe that we ought to follow the law of non-contradiction. But this doesn't mean we 
it, it, it governs us perfectly. So for instance, we can uh, choose to not follow it. So we can choose to behave as if we did not value the law of non-contradiction. Um, but there would still remain this force inside of us. For instance, if I started just saying a bunch of contradictions right now, uh, after a while, I, I think I would feel compelled uh, uh, to, uh, to start speaking normally again. Um, it seems like these are some guiding forces behind us um, as um, humans, as pertaining to us, the humans. Um, I don't know if that's going to is that going to be of any help right now, but maybe I've. Mm. Yeah, I, so I think that um, I mean one of the reasons why I said like I okay I can just bracket the dialetheism thing is because I think where the real disagreement here is 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 on this idea just the notion that. It, that there are particular logical rules that, like, we ought to follow. Um, it's not. It's, it's not that we. It's, general epistemic. Yeah, it's, rules, which I I just don't accept. It's not that we ought to follow them. Like we believe, uh, we believe we ought to follow them. Yeah, but I don't believe that. So, like, <laughs> I mean, mm. so so it's like you're saying. Well, you know, there's this kind of what law that's m making humans believe that. But I I've never. So when I think about logic, right, I would say, you know, I, I can say that, okay, here's an argument and um, the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion, right? So it's, it's logically valid. Um, or, or maybe I, I can say that, you know, this has a logically valid form. Um, but, but then I, 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 I mean, I wouldn't just say like, oh, well, you know, so if you accept the premises, you ought to accept the conclusion or, uh, or anything like that. At least, not without reference. Okay, to specific desires and goals. Maybe let me try another another example. So, for example, um, I would say another one of these laws is that we necessarily believe that beliefs should be based on evidence. So no, I don't believe that. Yeah, you don't believe that either. But I, it, <laughs> but I just so. It, I'm sorry. I'm no, not, 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 no, 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 no. Uh, no, I, 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 I fully uh, appreciate. Any of those shoulds and oughts, right? Like, I, I don't believe that. <laughs> so. it, just, it just seems, I, I, I struggle to, to believe you in a sense because, um, so, okay, maybe let's say subconsciously. So, um, how, I don't understand, how can you um, operate if you don't believe that beliefs should be based on evidence? Of course, like when you wake up in the morning, you believe that everything you, like, all the objects, like when you have to brush your teeth, you know that things are going to be there. You believe that um, you have a bunch of you have a bunch of inductive evidence. You're waking up every single morning, and these objects are always in the same place, and they don't kind of change through time. And uh, um, you kind of subconsciously, or unconsciously believe that. Uh, I mean, at least it seems to me that beliefs should be based on evidence. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I this is another thing we're going to have. I don't, actually don't think that I, I don't accept that there are any like inductive rules. But um, again, I bracket that point. Um, <laughs> so the, the point I'm making is, um, look, I want my beliefs to be based on evidence, right? I, w I want to have true beliefs and I want to avoid false beliefs. And it seems to me that the way to do that is to, you know, let's say apportion my beliefs to the evidence. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's like that's what kind of governs my representation of the world. Um, but I don't think of it in terms of like well, beliefs should be based on evidence, where this is somehow a kind of categorical norm, where this like norm holds independently of your goals and desires. Um, you know, whenever whenever I use a claim like ought or should, right? That's always, I think, it's always just going to come down to well, you know this is a particular means of satisfying certain goals and desires. So it's always just going to come down to these, it's like means end relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so like, does that make sense? Yeah. So, so if I change the, so let me, let me try the last uh, attempt down this route. Maybe then I'll say something else. So if I changed, we necessarily um, believe we necessarily desire to hold beliefs that uh, uh, are based on evidence. 
would you be more inclined to accept that? So we necessarily um, desire to follow the law of non-contradiction or something like that? We, ne we necessarily desire to follow... Hmm. Um, you mean like... So I guess I would have to, given that I said I'm, I'm willing to just bracket concerns about dialetheism, um, I, I think that that means... Yeah, yeah. So let me... Okay, so let me be more specific. So uh, I necessarily desire to follow the law of non-contradiction in the non-referential um, uh, domains, let's say. So yeah, we no, we do actually have to bracket this stuff because there are some people who are well. For instance, I have a friend who's um, who's a trivialist who believes that um, that all propositions are true, and so <laughs> that also entails that all propositions are false. Okay. Um, so he believes in like universal contradiction everywhere um and uh, uh it sounds kind of crazy but uh surprising how difficult it is to um refute that position um well moral naturalism so, seems kind of crazy to me too just uh, you can go on <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh yeah um you know like i if if for the purposes of this discussion we're just like ignoring people like that then yes it's going to be the case that everybody um wants to avoid non-contradiction okay but i, I so e even a person like that i would kind of want to push back a bit and say that subconsciously he must be reaching his views by using the law of non-contradiction i i don't know how um uh, so maybe this is not a conscious thing. So maybe when you self-reflect, um, maybe these laws are not exactly conscious. But um, so when you self-reflect, you can say, okay, I don't really give a fuck about these laws. Um, what, what would you think about that? This um, kind of subconscious aspect uh, of of the laws? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know what to like do with that. I just, I mean, I, 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 I mean, it's, you can always kind of postulate these sorts of subconscious processes, but it, I, I, what am I supposed to say? It's, it's kind of like when, when I'm, you know, sometimes like I have a conversation with somebody and um, they might just say, oh, you know, you're lying or like you're not being honest about your position. Yeah, it's I true. Think, well, I mean, mm. okay, uh, like, I mean, you can believe that. That's fine. But then, I, I mean, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that information. I mean, I feel like the conversation just has nowhere to go. So yeah, no, I wouldn't uh, say I wouldn't say you're lying or your I, friend I is don't lying. Know how to? Oh, sorry. No, I, I was just saying I wouldn't say that you were lying or your friend is lying. Actually, I don't. No, I don't believe that in the slightest. I'm using that as an analogy. Yeah. Okay. So, hmm. Sorry. I, I know that you weren't accusing me of lying, but yeah. I feel, to me, it feels like the same kind of thing because. What can I do other than say, well, sure, like, maybe, I mean, I don't know, I don't have any reason to think that, um, that there are these, I don't, there's like a, what would it be, you know, subconscious desire to follow the law of non-contradiction. That, that doesn't seem that plausible to me, um, but... I, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> okay. So, so let me let me flip let me flip this maybe in a sense. So it just it would seem very weird maybe to misuse a philosophical term a bit queer if we if we humans weren't governed uh, by by any laws in this sense by any subconscious laws in this sense it would just kind of strike me as a kind of human exceptionalism that we are kind of free of. Um, thinking whatever we want about acting subconsciously however about yeah we're not guided um in any way by nature like basically all the other organisms i can see in the empirical world um so yeah i i no i, I agree with that i mean i i'm i'm fine with the idea there's like you know let's say law governed processes going on in the brain um but i like if we're now trying to specify what exactly those are, um, I don't see any reason to expect that it's going to be something like a subconscious desire uh, not to believe contradictions. Um, hmm. So, so, so it's, it's just a specific example, really, may, maybe. But if, if the general point is just, well, you know, there are like, yeah, that say there are brain processes happening that I'm not aware of that are influencing. Well, I mean, that's definitely that seems to be definitely true. Um, yeah. 
Hmm. So, so for example, so if I brought up the, um, the fact that we that cognitive dissonance seems to be a thing that um, uh, we experience and which it it kind of um, makes us pause. Um, so one way of interpreting of interpreting cognitive dissonance and and you okay you're not going to agree with this so maybe it's that we have these um, um, these, necess- these necessary uh, maybe let's say unconscious laws that govern us and when we do hold contradictory beliefs they manifest in the fact that we they're compelling us to to try to uh, resolve this contradiction. Um, so maybe yeah, I agree that's a that's a way of interpreting it yeah. Um, okay. Um, you know, I, I imagine there are probably other ways of interpreting it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think actually, as, as well, you know, um, like you, you mentioned this point about hu- human exceptionalism, but it, I mean, it is the case that you know, in, in biology, the the law is variation, right? <laughs> like that's the that's the big thing. Um, so I, I mean, again, this isn't really maybe that relevant to the point, but um, it, you know. I, I would expect that any sort of, you know, subconscious law or, or whatever, or, you know, law that, that you can point to that's influencing people, I, the, the initial expectation I would have for that is, well, actually, it's not really a law. There's going to be ex- exceptions to it, because that seems to be the case with pretty much everything in biology. Um, yeah, no, no, no. I, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, yeah. So I think that that's a good point. Um... But I think you made a bunch of good points up until now. But I think that's another good point. And um, so so may- maybe I would have to add another qualifier and say, I don't know, healthy humans. So uh, I can conceive of cases where because there is biological variation and sometimes this biological variation is very strong. So in the case of maybe somebody that's, that's born, I don't know, without a brain or with some mm, problems in... Uh, um, yeah, the natural architecture that builds us as humans. Um, yeah, I, I could grant that um, in those cases, um, uh, maybe these processes wouldn't uh, take hold. So, um, yeah, I, I would maybe say that with with uni- if if I would I would like to say these processes are universal to humans. So, with universality, I would mean uh, uh, maybe healthy humans. If that if this makes sense. To you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, but we still uh, haven't agreed that these things is, exist. So, um, so if we want to move on from this point, you're going to have to grant me this again. <laughs> but or otherwise, we can keep on kind of talking about it a bit. Uh, so it seems to me you've you're kind of inclined to agree that these these kinds of things do exist. But the examples that I'm giving to you. Are not really representative of what these things would be. Well, I don't know. Um, I think is my position. I think I would just be agnostic about this. Um, yeah, it, it seems to me that there's a lot we don't really understand about, you know, the brain and subconscious processes and all of that at the moment. Um, what you've suggested there is one plausible interpretation of what's going on, but you know, there are probably lots of others. Um, uh, I I think that. It seems as a general point that, like, you know, th- so let's put it this way. There are processes going on in the brain that are going to influence, um, you know, my sort of conscious experiences and beliefs. Uh, those processes that, I'm, that are subconscious that I'm, I'm not aware of. Um, and then these are going to exhibit certain law-like regularities when we look at humans in general. Um, y- yeah, like, I agree with that. Um, so... I don't know, maybe that's enough, right? Like, we, we have a sort of foundation there. And then if you want to say, well, you know, look, here's one plausible example of this. Um, okay, I mean, we can just go with that and see where it goes. Uh, okay, so I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. The desire to, uh, like, there's a subconscious desire not to believe contradictions. Um, all right. Okay. <laughs> Let's it and see where that goes. <laughs> yeah, so I, so... Um, so I, I would uh, uh, first of all say that um, I would absolutely agree with you that I'm just kind of um, postulating things that um, uh, I think are plausible in, in in a sense, but I'm not just I'm not uh, kind of uh, dogmatically saying these things exist for sure. Uh, just it, um, of course, 
it just seems to me so these seemings bring me to a kind of view about morality so okay so let's say we we part let's say we kind of don't we don't really agree but uh, we have some of this foundation we we can uh, you you can you can basically grant it to me a bit so from this i would say that um uh when we have specified the laws of classical logic or uh the laws of statistics um these these are attempts by us to uh uh formalize uh, these laws that govern us. So what do I mean by this? I mean that um, uh, a whole enterprise, when we have these rules of classical logic, um, that a thought of, of some kind of, in, in a way, they thought of special with respect to other kinds of logic. I think that the reason why they thought of special is because they're mapping on to this cognitive architecture. Uh, these subconscious laws we have. And in the same way, uh, for instance, the theory of hypothesis testing in statistics is mapping onto our pattern recognition abilities. So um, another uh, another process I would say we are kind of subconsciously guided by is that if we, um, if we see evidence of something, we are brought to uh, beliefs. So, for example, um, if I see somebody flip a coin a thousand times and it always comes up head, I am necessarily compelled to believe that that coin is fake. So if I see him, I, I'm just, there's something in me that, um, uh, that tells me that I believe I, I ought to, uh, uh, to believe that the coin is, uh, is, is uh, a rigged coin. Uh, okay, so maybe I, I stop here because I talked for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. I, I, again, you know, you, you use that term "ought" in in that last <laughs> sentence, and I, yeah, I, I I'm not sure I'm gonna. I think that's probably where I'm gonna have some problems. Um, <laughs> but oh no, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry, okay. sorry, sorry, sorry. Let, let me revert back to let's say I I desire. Um, how how would I reformulate this in terms of uh, of desires? So. Uh, or, or maybe I would say that this, in this case, I just have a belief. I I'm, subcon I'm subconsciously brought to the belief that the coin is um, is rigged. But but can I defend? So I would kind of say it is an ought because I, if somebody else were to do were, were to in front of me were to see this process and he would say, oh no no, the coin isn't rigged isn't rigged I don't think it would only be a belief I would because I would be kind of looking at him and saying what's wrong with you like you ought to believe what I just did given the evidence you've just been um subjected to yeah I might say the same kind of thing but again it's with reference to my desire to um you know uh, uh believe true things and not believe false things and then I I'm just making an assumption that like I'm kind of just projecting that to other people, right? And assuming that we're all engaging in this sort of project of inquiry. Um, so, okay. uh, so, so, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So, so, um, let me map all these kind of thoughts to desires. I think uh, uh, I was thinking about this in my spare time because I, yeah. I actually uh, thought about the criticism you're giving and I think it, it has some merit. So I was, I, and I think that maybe um, desires can do. Uh, so of course, at a certain point, I'm going to offer a reformist definition of morality. Uh, um, okay, so so um, let's say let's say you would kind of partially agree that uh, the classical logic and, for example, the the, um, the theory of hypothesis testing is kind of mapping onto these uh, uh, subconscious processes uh, we have. Um, then, and here is where I would introduce the moral domain. So we've talked about the logical domain, the inferential domain, and I will talk about the moral domain. And I would say, for instance, that one of these subconscious processes that guides us in the moral domain is that... Um, it would be a belief that my unnecessary suffering is bad. So, um, what do you say about that? <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, I'd like, 
I mean, we can we can build whatever we want into the subconscious uh, okay. architecture. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're being ve- you're, you're being very kind to me. So okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I would say so one of these um, kind of principles we are necessarily uh, compelled to obey is that all of us uh, believe that uh, our uh, that our personal unnecessary suffering is bad, and um, so at this point. Um, what I think our normative theories are doing is what our logical and statistical theories are doing. They are trying to map on to uh, these uh, these bridge processes, these architecture that we have because we're organisms. And um, uh, so in this sense, uh, we um, kind of obtain a morality that uh, we obtain the mind independence um, so we can say that uh, moral statements are true if they correspond to these uh, uh, processes that uh, govern us. Right. Okay. Um, so let's let's say that I, I do have all of this subconscious architecture. Yeah. Let's say that you know I, I have um, subconsciously the desire to avoid non-contradiction all right but i don't have that consciously um that's not what i don't desire to avoid non-contradiction consciously so why should i care that that's what's going on subconsciously similarly if um you know if, if we say well there's this like subconscious uh desire to avoid unnecessary suffering but like maybe i don't believe that consciously um okay why why would i i mean so here's the thing like it seems to me that I mean, sure, we could we could come up with some theory that like matches these subconscious uh, that, that kind of matches or corresponds to, in some sense, this subconscious architecture. Mm-hmm. And like, I mean, I guess you could kind of moralize that system. You could say, well, you know, that's then telling us what we ought to do. But like, I could then I could do I could come up with some other system, um, which instead matches my conscious uh, beliefs and desires, right? And like now, I have a different normative. If I moralize that system, I've got a different normative system. So yeah, I completely. Like, why, why should I just follow that one instead? I, I completely agree with what you just said. So uh, basically, I would say that my reformist definition uh, does a good job at representing what we mean when um, we talk uh, about moral statements. So you could do what you're saying, but I think that when we um, um, uh, I think that, yeah, I just think that my reformist definition maybe c- captures, uh, uh, what we mean when we, when we utter moral statements is that you're doing something bad, uh, but it's not because of some conscious, um, so your conscious, your conscious framework would be subjective while, while my, while my, my framework, for instance, would be objective in a sense, because it, it holds for for every healthy human so your your well, system why does that make a difference well no it just it just counts towards the fact that this reformist definition uh, kind of captures uh, uh, better than uh, uh, what we probably mean because we have these processes inside all of us than um, than your definition uh, that you propose just as a counter example uh, right there i don't i don't know i'm not sure what you mean when you say like it captures what what we mean because i mean it's not capturing what i mean right like i mean if I, because when i'm talking i mean like, i i use you know if, if i if i don't believe um like if i don't have the conscious desire to avoid non-contradiction for instance um and i mean it's not like again i, I you know that wouldn't be that unusual there are you know, lots of people who seem to um who similarly seem to not have that desire like how is it in what sense is it capturing what i mean like, it doesn't seem to be it seems like and unless you're saying that like meanings are somehow tied to subconscious processes um but that doesn't seem very plausible um oh i, I see i see what you're getting at because um mm. Of course, there has to be some way that the subconscious bleeds into the conscious. Um, um, 
mm, I don't know. I think I, uh, I think you make me, you make a good point. Um, but I, I'm not sure it doesn't capture though. Um, it, it just that what I'm saying is that what we, what we necessarily, uh, believe we ought to do is what we ought to do. Um, and I'm defining ought in terms of what we necessarily believe we ought to do. And, uh, it seems like these things should exist, uh, due to the fact that we are biological organisms that are governed by some laws. So, um, of course, yeah, of course, the subconscious must bleed into the conscious so somewhat because um, when you say the, when you say you don't believe in the, you you don't believe you ought to follow the law of non-contradiction, uh, but in your everyday life you, you do. It, for example, in this conversation, we have been following it all along um, because we. Okay, so 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 maybe here I, I'm I'm putting you off because we could, we could have a different conversation where I where I wouldn't be following it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, but in that in but in that conversation we would be acting as if we I I don't think we would be acting. Um, yeah, we would just be pretending to not value the law of non contradiction. So if we started to talk in gibberish right now, me and you. Uh, we would be going against. Um, I, I don't think it would necessarily be gibberish. Um, I think I, you could point to things that I. I mean, again, like maybe this doesn't matter. I, again, I'm kind of willing to just bracket this because <laughs> I think I think the more important point is like, look, I. Well, actually, there are two. There are two big, big points. Okay. Um, so I, I suppose so. One is I. I just don't care. I don't care what what's going on like subconsciously. That's not. That's not how I'm using moral language, and I, I don't think other people should. I could not care less about if if I have like a, some subconscious desire to uh, say avoid the non-contradiction or to uh, minimize suffering. Well, so what? If I don't have the conscious desire, then I I couldn't care less. Um, and it seems like morality is something I should care about. So that's one point. And then the the other point, though, is I, th I think, look, I mean, I've been willing to kind of grant that there's this subconscious architecture and I'm willing to, to grant that there are maybe there are sort of very kind of general, um, very kind of vague things we can say about it. So it might be the case that there is um, a desire to avoid non-contradiction or a desire to avoid unnecessary suffering. I don't think that's going to do much to get you like moral to get you any kind of moral system um so you can you could like we could we could just kind of grant that like all right well maybe it's like a fact that um unnecessary suffering is bad um but then that's going to be compatible with a huge range of um of like different moral theories yeah, yeah no um, no of course yeah yeah so you know i i don't think it really gets you very much okay so, um, so let me let me answer your let me, yeah, yeah. Let, let me try to answer your first point so um so initially when i thought about this i wasn't thinking really subconsciously so i granted this subconscious element that maybe i shouldn't have because uh, um i think they uh, at least if they're subconscious they actively bleed into the conscious in some way and um uh, to your second point instead so I was reading a bit about desires and apparently there are some philosophical theses that say that normative beliefs are desires. So that normative beliefs equals desires. So we're actually using the same word for two different things. But even let's say I, I, um, I accept that these are only desires. Um, desires, if I'm not mistaken, they're usually defined as appearances of goodness. So um, in terms of appearances of goodness. Um, so first of all, would you agree with? I, I don't know. I'm I'm going to appeal to your to your knowledge right now. Would you agree with I, it? I I I I don't know. I, I don't have like uh, a, a theory of a desire. I'm I I would just use it to mean like something I want. Okay. Okay. So yeah. uh, so the definition I saw about uh, the, the definition it wasn't really a definition. It was somebody trying to exp um, in a paper trying to explain explain what desires meant. Um, 
or why desires motivated us is that they gave us this kind of appearance of goodness. And I think I would be willing to work with uh, just um, desires as uh, appearances of goodness. So uh, uh, I think I've been putting you off because I've been using alt. I mean, there's a bunch of reasons why I've been putting you off, but one of them is that it's because I've been using alt, I think. So maybe if we, if we just... Um, uh, and I'm kind of... Uh, mm, I'm kind of unwilling to departure from the, these orts because I've just, uh, in my mind, I think a bit, I think a bit that way. But we should just like maybe we should just move to appearances of goodness. Uh, that uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that's going to help because um, like I, I don't think of desires as appearances of goodness. And one of the reasons why is that if we're talking about goodness, we're talking about something that's kind of mysterious to me. I mean, that's one reason why I'm an anti-realist, right? <laughs> like. So I think I kind of know what desires are, and I can, I mean, maybe I, like, I don't have a theory of them, I don't have a theory of desire, um, but there are lots of ways I can just sort of, I mean, I, I could just do it ostensibly, right? Like if somebody asks me, well, what is a desire? I can just kind of uh, uh, sort of point to particular types of behavior or particular types of mental state um, to help answer that question. Um, you know, when we talk about like, des so desire seems to be, you know, this just sort of useful folk psychological category um, that I think I have a good grasp of. Uh, I, I don't really know what an, an appearance of goodness is. So like if I desire a chocolate cake, I mean, is there an appearance of goodness? The, the problem is, is that when I think about goodness, I would be, I'd be inclined to understand that in terms of, you know, I'd be like, well, the, something can be like good for somebody in the sense that you know they desire it right so i yeah it wouldn't really be helpful to say that the chocolate cake has an appearance of goodness um okay um okay um so a chocolate cake when you desire a chocolate cake it doesn't have an appearance of goodness you would say um okay so well maybe it does i mean i i'm not sure what that means mm. okay so i'm not sure either <laughs> no but yeah uh okay so okay okay so maybe to go forward let's just say desires without um, um let's just say we have these uh, subconscious processes that um uh, you say that you grant to me that they bleed into the conscious but they're just desires um so we have a desire to uh Mm, uh, hold beliefs that are based on evidence. We have a, a desire to follow the law of non-contradiction. We have a desire to not suffer, let's say. Um, and uh, yeah, then I would... Uh, uh, so for our desires uh, regarding uh, um, uh, suffering, for instance, and um, I would... Uh, uh, I would say that our normative theories are trying to map onto uh, uh, onto these. So maybe let me let me just uh, open another um, way of thinking about this. So it seems very strange to me that our normative theories are not mapping onto anything that is uh, uh, descriptively human. So, for example, we don't come up with normative theories that say like what is good is green, so we should maximize maximize the amount of green in the world, or we don't come up with normative theories that say uh, we should torture children. So, when we are developing these normative theories, it, it just it, it seems very intuitive to me that they're mapping it onto something that must be descriptively human, because. Uh, um, Otherwise, we could. Uh, I know. Otherwise, uh, why aren't we talking? Never talking about. I know normative theories that maximize uh, greenness, as I was saying before. Oh, okay. So yeah, I, no, I, I agree that um, that moral theories almost certainly do that. Uh, if we sort of understand this in terms of like there are, you know, well, I mean, so certainly there's going to be kind of co correlations between, in some sense, between like normative theories and uh, you know processes going on in humans um, and there's going to be important causal relations there um, I but like so okay maybe maybe one way to put, to put this problem is look um, it seems to me that like nobody really thinks that you know whatever 
you know, the, the, the way we happen to think, or maybe like the way that we have evolved to think is, is like thereby good. Um, so it, it, like just in itself. So like, we also have um, lots of cognitive biases. And I can come up with some theory of, um, like, let's take the epistemic case, right, I can come up with some theory of belief formation, which maps onto um, our cognitive biases. Uh, so, you know, I, I could, um, um, like, I don't know, what, what's, uh, what would be an example? Like, um, why no. can't I think of it? <laughs> no, I get, I get it. I get, I get what you're trying to say. No, yeah, but... I want to, I want to get, okay. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I, I mean, like there are, there are probabilistic errors that people always make. You know how some people, um, they, they do that thing where like, if you, they think that if you say that like Lindsay is a bank teller and, and then you say you give more information you're like Lindsay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. She's a and, and then people say, oh yeah, that's more probable, even though there's more information. No, that that's less. That's less. Oh yeah, that's more probable. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah so they'll say that the one where that you've given more information is more probable. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, like, I could come up with some theory which uh, tells, which says that that's what you ought to do, right? So, like, when you get more information in certain contexts about certain things, then you ought to conclude that it's more probable. And that would map on to the way that humans have, you know, for some reason we have been, you know, we have evolved, like our cognitive architecture is evolved in this way. Um, I mean, but like, I, but I mean, I guess this is what I'm, I, I was yeah. kind of getting at when I was like, look, you can give a moral theory that, um, you know, maps onto these subconscious beliefs, but I don't care about that. And honestly, I, I don't think that, I, I don't think most people care about that. Like, I think that it, you know, the reforming definition you're giving is just not going to latch on to what people actually care about, which seems like it would be a problem. Okay. Um, yeah, for a, for a reforming definition of morality. Okay, so let me let me go into that for a bit. So so when you when you're saying this thing about, um, for instance, these statistical biases we have, um, it, it, it a part of me thinks that you're kind of making my point for me because. We have developed this, this this theory of statistics that, in my view, of course, is mapping onto some descriptive process we have as beings that can do pattern recognition. So we're good at doing pattern recognition. So we're mapping onto this pro onto this process, and uh, the reason we call these other things biases. So, for example, I think biases would exist even in the moral domain. So if we would uh, go along my enterprise, um, these first principles would be the one that would construct the theory and what would be out of these first principles. Uh, I, uh, let's not call them subconscious process anymore because of course I don't know exactly what these, um, I was trying to give an account of what these could be, but I, I, I don't know. I just, seems very plausible to me and you agree with me that they're kind of something of descriptively uh, embodied in us as humans. And so um, it, in the statistical domain, we, we call some things biases because they exit the correct way in which to do pattern recognition. And um, we have axiomized statistics in a way that we see when we diverge from uh, the intrinsic natural ways in which we do pattern recognition. And um, yeah, so in that sense, it seems to me... Wait, uh, wait a minute. Why wouldn't a cognitive bias just be one of the intrinsic natural ways in which we do pattern recognition? Yeah, well, um, I, I would bring as evidence the theories of classical logic and statistics uh, for this. We have a way to recognize, and I can't really explain what it is, but we have a way to map onto our um, uh, deepestly held... Uh, natural laws that govern us, the rules that govern us. Uh, and uh, this is why we come up with theories like uh, logic and we maybe we have logical biases and statistical biases. Um, it's because these biases are not representative of how we are naturally, f uh, are naturally necessarily uh, compelled to believe. Um, so mm, maybe, oh, I had to... That seems Sorry, but is it kind of a, I mean, like, obviously, classical logic and, you know, formal statistical theories, I mean, these developed only in the last, like, you know, couple of hundred years. Um, and they're not, they don't seem very natural. Like, it, I mean, when you, I mean, sometimes, like, you know, you know I, I, when you try to teach people um, logic, right, there are certain sort of 
so I, I can, um, you know, remember the confusion in the classrooms when people were learning about the material conditional in classical logic because it, it behaves in such like weird ways. Um, and, and like similarly, when you when you learn about some of these uh, errors that people make with probability, like even even people who are um, actually trained in these subjects, you know, will quite often make the same errors. So it, it seems like those, you know, it, it seems like they're quite sort of natural ways of thinking. Um, whereas uh, the, the formal theories that we've created are often are often not so natural, even though we might think that, you know, well, we should trust those rather than mm -hmm. our intuitive processes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there is a sense when after this is explained, after these theories are explained to you, you naturally accept that they are saying something that's correct. So um, you kind of descriptively like have this moment where you say, ah, oh, that actually is uh, is something I deeply uh, um, bond with on, uh, and maybe this is just me being a STEM lord, <laughs> but maybe it, it, um, they seem to map onto some things we, we believe uh, uh, to be truer than the cognitive biases, um, so so let, so maybe so maybe maybe cognitive biases arise because we are finite beings and we don't have uh, this infinite processing power, so um, we can't we can't always abide by the optimal uh, we can't always abide optimally by these uh, rules we have in that are due to the fact that we are um, natural organisms, so. Um, so we develop these biases because uh, we have a limited processing power, and then when we um, when we formalize our, the rules that govern us in the inferential and logical sense, we intuitively see that they are actually uh, what matters, and these biases are due to some something else. Okay. Right. I mean. Uh... I, I, I mean, obviously, I agree that like people can be brought to um, agree that like certain uh, you know ways of thinking about probability, um, like a, a, a truth tracking, and certain other ones are not. Um, but maybe a way to ask this is like, do you think? I, I mean, it feels like there's a, there's a very strong claim here being made, which is something along the lines of in some sense, right, like these formal theories of classical logic and statistics and so on, like they, we've somehow evolved with them. Whereas, you know, the cognitive biases, which seem to be much more like manifest in people's everyday behavior and ev like everyday ways of thinking, um, those are in some sense deviations. Uh, no, no. Like, I, I... Even if I was to accept that, mm -hmm. like, I mean, I don't know. Do you think it's possible that we could have evolved differently? Uh, yes. Yes, I would grant that. Yes. Right. So we could have evolved such that, um, like, you know, what we're calling a cognitive bias. So the bias that in certain contexts, when somebody gets more information, they conclude that it's more probable. Um, it could uh, have been the case that that was part of our so, mm. subconscious architecture. Uh, so I'm not so sure in the example you gave because I think uh, creatures that evolve like that would quite quickly die off. Uh, uh, Why? I mean, humans uh, humans consciously uh, make those inferences and they haven't uh, died off. We've done quite well. <clears throat> um, yeah, but so what you would be saying in my framework is that basically... The, um, uh, <clears throat> So these processes that guide us, um, these rules we have to follow as organisms. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm putting at the center of these rules uh, the theory of classical logic and statistics. And you're saying, well, there could be some other. We could put some other theory, and uh, that another theory that guides us. But this other theory, uh, it wouldn't. Um, if you substitute the cognitive biases with a theory, it seems like that would spell a disaster because. Uh, we would be, um, we wouldn't even rec we we wouldn't have the ability to recognize uh, that what we're doing is not in our um, evolutionary self-interests. Uh, that's how I would put it. So, um, 
I would say these theories give us the ability to recognize that there's some optimal way to draw inferences and that's important for evolutionary reasons. So your example kind of, uh, so I'm, I'm struggling to accept your, your example f uh, from this I, point I, of view. I'm not, I'm not really following. Um, the, so the point I'm making is just like, um, you know, I, I, I'm just wondering if you think that it's, it's so, look, I mean, hu human beings consciously, right, make inferences that we would call cognitive biases, right? And I mean, they haven't died out as a result of consciously making those inferences. So, like, I don't see why that those sorts of inferences shouldn't be part of the subconscious architecture. Um, no, but I, I would agree with that. I'm not saying that, like, the subconscious architecture would have, uh, like, classical logic and formal statistical theories. And, I mean, I, I don't think it does have that anyway. Um, but, uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm just wondering if you think it's, like, do, do you think it's possible, um, you know, that, well, uh, that, that, yeah, like hu human beings evolved to have what I suppose is, you know, like to, to just not have like uh, some sort of formal theory, but instead have um, just kind of uh, sets of like, um, you know, I don't know, rough and ready sort of rules that often go wrong um, in, in, in you know, by our standards, like. Um, yeah, so, no, okay, yeah, I, I see where you're getting at. Uh, I, honestly, I don't know. So part of me is not sure if a self-reflecting being, <clears throat> like, part of me is not sure if, um, so if, if it could be a universe where every being that kind of gains consciousness uh, has to abide by some laws that... Um, uh, that are similar to ours. So they 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 talk about rationality. So their rationality um, would be similar to ours. Uh, I don't know because I don't have any da data points to kind of compare us to, since we don't know any alien species or something like that. Um, it seems possible, at least, that um, uh, something of the sort you're saying. But maybe so. Maybe I can resolve this by saying I could I, I can grant that the cognitive biases are due to um, evolution uh, too. Like um, I can grant that the cognitive biases are a way to kind of um, uh, 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 sometimes uh, maybe a good heuristics um, for our survival. But there's um, there's something deeper that. Uh, there's something deeper than uh, these heuristics, and these are like the first principles uh, that uh, we're governed by. I don't know. So, if I can ask you a question, so why why do you think we descriptively uh, think about classical logic as being uh, in some way special with respect to the other logics? I don't think it is. Um, so, I mean, I I don't think that way, and I don't think that other that I think there's lots of people who don't think that way. Um, it seems to me, you know, if I if I had to give an account of like why classical logic became, you know, dominant in like the Western tradition, um, because I, I don't think it is dominant in in other traditions. So I mean, look, look there's there's a few things going on with with this. There's what we might call like, uh, you know, our let's call it like natural rationality, right? Just our natural way of of drawing inferences, and I I don't think that that operates. In accordance with any particular formal theory, um, there are different ways that we can formalize this, um, and uh, and usually, you know, when we like, usually when we sort of give formal theories, um, you know, there's there's an attempt to sort of, I, I I don't know if if like I would say that we're even trying to kind of or at least everybody's even trying to kind of capture like natural rationality, because again, it seems to me that, that, that those nat that what we think of as like natural rationality, uh, often is not particularly is not particularly truth tracking. Right. Um, so, so can I ask you, sorry, that was a bit of a, of a ramble. I don't think that I, um, answered that question very well. Um, Oh no, no worries. No worries. Um, you can always, uh, you can always ramble again once I, I ask you. No, I ask you this question. Um, so, uh, so uh, let me just uh, open a little parenthesis and say that uh, my STEM brain might be too dumb to grasp some 
uh, some of the philosophy that's going on in this conversation. Uh, and okay, and then I'll close with parentheses. So let me ask you, uh, <laughs> let me ask you uh, this question. So, so it seems to me that you you said that if if we were to take uh, children right now, and if we were to teach them another kind of logic, uh, not the classical one, um, they would readily uh, grow to think of the other logic we're teaching them as being um, uh, the, let's say, right logic to form arguments and to... <clears throat> so if we were to teach them a paraconsistent logic, yeah. um, would they grow up... Would it be natural... Would they just... Um, naturally kind of uh, uh, accept it and uh, work with it and uh, or, or would or would uh... yeah I, I think so okay okay so okay so this is the heart of this is the heart I think of of where we disagree in because I yeah I I don't I yeah I don't think so um so I looked at some papers regarding this, this... I, I mean, but wait so okay. I mean there, but there are like there are whole like traditions which do I mean seem to operate with like para consistent logics uh, for example um, like it's much more uh, prevalent in at least as I understand it I mean I could be wrong about this of course but like in in Eastern traditions um, you know their like way of thinking is sort of more tolerant of contradictions and so they've developed you know like if, if you were to kind of formalize it um, you'd have something like a like a para consistent logic. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I think for even in our Western tradition, we we hold the kind of contradictory beliefs when it comes to, uh, especially things in the religious sphere. So maybe we say God is uh, both His Son and Himself. So we have these kind of contradictions, even in the Western um, mm, tradition. But um, the, the only paper I could see, th there's only really one paper that I've found, at least, that investigates, because, um, because of course, uh, what you're bringing up, I think, is, uh, uh, is very important. And I, and I thought about it, so I wanted to investigate it. And I found only one paper talking about the law of non-contradiction. And they did... Um, and... Um, it, Sorry, one paper who did a study on the law of non-contradiction, if I'm recalling this right, and it was a cross-cultural study. And uh, what they discovered was that, um, well, they, they gave pre preliminary evidence that it seems like we all abide by this law of non-contradiction. I'm not sh So, um, yeah. Uh, well, we all subconsciously? Because, I mean, again, I, I don't... No, no we I all... Don't, we, don't yeah. No, no, no. We all, de we all descriptively, um, yeah. descriptively abide by it when in conversations or... Um, yeah, that's a, that's a puzzling one, though, because I think that um, you can... So, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure what the paper is, but, like, when you say that people descriptively abide by it, I completely agree. Like, I think that you can... Um, Give an, so you can give like an account of people's behavior in entirely sort of classical logical terms. Um, and I think you can do that in entirely uh, paraconsistent logical terms. Um, I, like there are different ways of representing people's behavior. And um, so I, I'm not sure what it means to say like people descriptively. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, I actually think it's it's absolutely true that we could you know, give a description of people as kind of following the law of non-contradiction. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you give an alternative description, that's probably just as good where... Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so, so now I would have to, of course, recall the details of the study, but uh, of course I can't. So uh, let me ask you another question. So, so do you think we humans are kind of a tabula rasa when it comes to, say, um, uh, yeah, logical domain, at least? No, um, no, I, I like I said, I when I, I, I mentioned, you know, I think there are certain like there's a sort of natural rationality and presumably that's going to be influenced by, you know, like our evolutionary history and, um, you know, like, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture. I mean, there's uh, it's okay, okay. culture and uh, and biology play an important role in making us who we are. So, you know. Okay, so maybe uh, without getting fixated on the law of non-contradiction, maybe maybe coherence, maybe maybe um, being coherent is something that we uh, uh, 
we all maybe as humans seem to value maybe because our languages kind of have to obey these these coherence structures or something like that so yeah okay um i don't i mean this may, maybe is is a slight tangent from this but it's just something that's kind of bugging me throughout this this conversation which okay is, go forward right so let, let's just say that i kind of let's just say that i grant that like everybody has this architecture of, of classical logic um but then what if like it seems like even if that's the case right i can then sort of sit down and like reason about things and i might then come to the conclusion that uh that there are some true contradictions and then i might think oh well if there are some true contradictions that means i should accept the paraconsistent logic instead so like even if i agree with this biological claim um or or sort of psychological claim about the sort of natural constitution of the human mind mm -hmm. right I might still reject it, you know, and like, I think that this is, I, I don't know, I, that, that still seems to me to be like a, a big gap between, like, of course, I could give a theory about the sort of rules that are subconsciously accepted by human beings. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I still am not seeing like how I'm getting any sort of no, know, okay. norm or ought from, from that. But that just seems, I mean, it's like, yeah, that just seems like a description of yeah, yeah, okay, this is the way human brains work. And, yeah, um, yeah, that's where the, right. yeah, no, uh, I understand the point. That, that, that's where the reforming definition would come in. But first, let me say something that I think is important right now, that um, I, would, I would say that classical logic or statistics are just our best effort, uh, like uh, our, our best effort to get to these principles. So, for example, uh, Dilethiists, um, so when you were describing what you were doing, uh, it's another way to me of saying, uh, okay, so maybe classical logic isn't the best way of describing being, of, I'm, I'm, I'm just fully, um, I would fully grant that maybe classical logic isn't the best way to map onto these principles we have. Maybe it's some kind of other logic. Maybe the Dalithius are bringing this, this up right now, but I would just appeal to the fact that there is uh, this uh, this structure, and that we can uh, self reflectingly map onto this structure. And um, okay, so at, at this point, um, so w where do we get the orts? Uh, uh, I, I would just say that if there's if there, if there are these um, these uh, these structures that necessarily compel us to value certain things. Um, we when we talk about um so for for instance when we say you've we've made a logical error um so if you make a contra if you contradict your, yourself i would say you're wrong <laughs> and i think we're using uh, uh, wrong in the moral sense in the same way we would be using it in the logical in uh, in the logical sphere so if i see you for instance self-harming yourself i would say that's wrong and uh what I'm saying is I'm I'm mapping onto these um, I'm mapping onto the, the structure that exists in the logical inferential and moral domain. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, so uh, one of the reasons why I don't like this view is because it kind of smells like. So first of all, it's it, um, why I don't like it as um, I don't feel like I like it is because one of the reasons is that. Uh, it kind of feels a bit akin to determinism in some ways. In um, It's not fully deterministic, all but it's just saying that our morality is already set in stone for us. And we're just um, mm, kind of uh, searching, searching for it in these processes. And this is very unsatisfactory to me, to be honest, actually. Uh, but this this has, hasn't got anything to do with the discussion, so... Yeah, so maybe I'll just let you <laughs> respond. Well, I, it does. I mean, you know, you're, I mean, you're explaining why you don't like the view. So I guess that does have something to do with it. But, I, I don't feel like I don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my feelings you know, towards okay, view. Yeah. So it's so to me, it, it seems like all right. You're you're trying to give a theory of um, the sort of subconscious architecture of the human mind. Cool. Um, you know. Yeah. Okay. So. I don't have any objections to that? Okay. Okay. So the the ulterior claim would be that. 
if we um, redefine good as what we necessarily think is good according to these uh, to this architecture, then uh, uh, we would be um, then this would be good enough for uh, how we use these terms. Um, it, uh, actually, it would improve uh, uh, the explanatory power, and it would. Uh, uh, kind of clarify what we're, what we're doing when we're using oughts and goodness. And so that, there would be a, an ulterior claim here that is way, way more ambitious and it, it, yeah. Yeah, and has some probably, yeah, I mean, it, and it can be attacked, I imagine, in various different ways. Well, I mean, I think so. I, I think that, that ambitious claim is, I, I don't know, that, that seems deeply implausible. I mean, it might, it, it might be true. Uh, so you know the idea that like we're going to have anything like a sort of substantive moral theory built into our built into this subconscious architecture that's right i just i don't think that's true um i think that you're going to get at best very vague sort of you know it'll be stuff like you know um it, it might not even be a moral theory it might be like in some sense like a no it probably is it probably would be a moral theory because humans you know kind of evolved to be a sort of social species obviously um so, you know, we evolved for like peace and cooperation, or at least we, you know, to kind of cooperate with others to at least some extent. So we've probably got, yeah, in, in the sort of subconscious architecture, if, if there is such a thing, um, then it seems plausible that, um, maybe there are like general rules that evolved, like, you know, unnecessary suffering is bad, um, you, you know, cooperate with other people, etc. Um, I mean, even that is is difficult, though. You know, um, like so. This interestingly, the context where I've I've read most about this is actually in the context of anti-realist attacks on realism, because it comes up in the evolutionary debunking argument. You know, like um, very often, anti-realists will, will sort of say, you know, we can we can account for our evaluative attitudes, the evaluative attitudes that we have. They didn't evolve to be tracking any kind of independent truth. They evolved in order to promote peace and cooperation or something along those lines. Yeah, or yeah. Rather, they evolved to promote survival and reproduction. And, you know, because humans are social species, cooperating helps to promote survival and reproduction. Um, and, you know, th but the thing is, it's like, it's not, um, I mean, like the, the empirical evidence on like exactly what evolved it is, is it, it seems to me that it's unlikely that um, there are sort of, there's anything approaching like a substantive moral theory, but if there is, um, okay, then I, I think that what you're doing is, um, you know, you're giving a theory of our subconscious architecture, and if you want to use moral terms to refer to that, then you can. I mean, there's there's nothing there that's that's. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have anything there to object to. I mean, you can do that. I yeah, yeah I'll, that's I'll, what it, most people are doing, and it's not what I'm going to do. But if you want to do, that, <laughs> go ahead. Oh no, okay, that's okay, okay. So, um, uh, yeah. So, in a sense, um, in a sense, what I'm set, what I'm doing. Well, I don't know if I'm actually doing this, but it kind of seems to me that I'm turning the, the evolutionary debunking argument a bit on itself. So. Um, I think it, it, it's misguided to think about these other orts. Uh, like I don't understand even what these other, um, other what these other orts or this other idea of goodness could be that is um, outside of us. I, I don't understand where it could come from. So again, this would be uh, Mackie's queerness argument. I, I don't know how we could reach it. Uh, I don't know where um, where we could ever find it. So. Um, in a sense, my reformist definition is coming closer to the anti-realist, I think. Uh, I would agree with you, and I would be willing to accept that. Um, but, so, it, um, so I, I just would reject that we should be looking for this, uh, these other oughts or this other goodness. Uh, um, I don't think this, I don't actually think this is, uh, I'm not sure, uh, that's to be, to, be, to be honest, I'm not sure if this is what we're actually doing when we're thinking about goodness and ought claims. I don't think we're appealing to this other, um, um, well, maybe sometimes, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure uh, uh, because I think you, give a, you gave a good example of this, for instance, on Twitter. If we had this, um, this machine 
that would identify these mind independent um, moral truths for us. Uh, and it would say, for instance, torturing babies is uh, the right thing. You should just go right along and do it. Um, I think this is not w what we're doing when we think about morality. Uh, we, we are simply trying to map on to uh, some descriptive principles that guide us. And, um, and yeah, so that's what I would say. That's, yeah, that's what I would say to that, I guess. Uh, uh, but but uh, but I w maybe I would say another thing to the anti-realist. So I would say maybe I would say another thing to the anti-realist is that, uh, mm, that it seems to me that when we define ought and good, we're kind of we're trying to uh, clarify the use of these words in um, in natural language. So uh, um, why wouldn't an anti-realist accept uh, this kind of I identification? With these words used to um, uh, map on to um, these processes that bind us, I, I, I don't think that's what people are doing when they use moral language. Um, I don't think. It, I mean, if we just, in fact, I think we often do discover that we have uh, certain subconscious inclinations which we just think are really bad. Right? People will often be like, "No, that you know, it sucks." So, like, it seems like. Um, tribalism for example seems to be um something that we like that's like part of our subconscious architecture we evolved for that um i mean that just manifests itself all the time in people's behavior um and yet a lot of people will look at that and say that really sucks um like uh, you know and so if 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 like the moral if if you're going to come up with a moral theory that's trying to map onto these uh sort of moral norms that we evolved to have um I suspect, I mean, I could be wrong, I suspect a lot of people would just say that's irrelevant to what they are trying to do. In fact, I think a lot of people would see morality as explicitly about trying to kind of overcome our our genes, like overcome our, you know, biological uh, inclinations. And, you know, we're trying to make ourselves into something better. Um, and because we have the ability to uh, engage in like reflection and we can you know we're, we're not sort of creatures that just act on our impulses and we can actually stop and and think about our impulses and we can think about the sort of rules that we want to accept and we can you know yeah like engage in in reasoning and all of that well hey that's that's what we can do to overcome um all of the ways in which biology has made us you know flawed and uh, yeah, yeah, you, we, uh, and yeah, we we want to transcend ourselves as usual. Uh, this is uh, something we often, as humanity, we like to uh, engage in this. But um, okay, so I, I um, in a sense, I would agree with what you just said, but I would see it in a different way because um, if we take the classical laws of logic, um, I would say that they're mapping. Um, of course, we disagree about this, but I would say that they're mapping onto this kind of cognitive architecture we have. And then, uh, of course, we have developed even biases. Um, but through through maybe the use of reason, through self-reflection, we can kind of weed out the biases from the, um, from the underlying principles. And the same, so I would parallel this with a moral domain. So we we can maybe through uh, self-reflection, we can kind of find these self-evident uh, principles and then we can weed out uh, the other evolutionary biases that uh, they are still part of a evolutionary baggage, uh, but uh, we recognize them as um, uh, imperfections or as uh, ways in which the architecture is going wrong because we make mistakes. We're not... Um, perfect beings and so uh, uh so i would i would kind of i would in be inclined to agree are you mapping like in what sense are you mapping the subconscious architecture then like if because if you're just going to say well because it sounds like what you're saying is just well whatever we happen to come to as being the best theory so whatever we end up choosing is the best moral theory like well you know that maps the the sort of deep or like real subconscious architecture and then all of this other stuff all of these other subconscious processes that you know influence people's evaluative attitudes and behavior um oh well like like that that's like the deviant stuff you know that that stuff um 
is is like a, an influence that we can you know put aside it, but it seems like that judgment you know the judgment that this is the real architecture and this is the deviant stuff um that's just coming from whatever moral theory you happen to accept like it's, it's, it's not like you have a theory, like an independent theory of the subconscious architecture, and then the moral theory is just tracking that. Um, you, need the, you need the moral theory to tell you what counts as the real architecture. Hmm. So I, I'm not so... So, um, so just to um, maybe conclude where I would be going with these self-evident moral principles, let's say, these web, uh, in what sense are they self-evident? In the sense that they map onto the deepest parts of our architecture. And I would, um, I would then go ahead that, that, uh, to say that Sidwick in the method of ethics is probably the um, person that did the best job uh, at mapping onto these. Uh, but okay, so this is irrelevant anyway to, to what you just said. Um, so... Um, uh, I, I I feel like you're kind of asking me a lot because uh, you're asking me to, um, so maybe my view is just wrong. Um, maybe my view is just descriptively wrong. But you're kind of asking me. So in my view, the laws of the, these laws of logic are mapping onto our cognitive architecture, and uh, uh, you would be asking me to say, well, how? Why have we chosen these laws, and why have we excluded these biases? And um, I think uh, we, the logical biases from the, the laws of classical logic, why have we made this... Um, uh, I, I was actually asking specifically about, about morality um, in, that, in that case, rather than... Just to clarify. Um, yeah, but, but I would... Um, so... And, yeah, but, but, okay, so, so, so would you see... So would you grant that in the realm of logic, we are able to, so we are able to uh, kind of see logical biases or, and, uh, and see logical principles? I know you no, you don't you, you don't yeah. grant this. So for the purpose of the conversation, yes, and I think that um, there's the, the reason why I was focusing specifically on morality there is because I think that there probably is a lot more um, variation in uh, moral attitudes than in the uh, uh, than in the case of logic. So um, yeah, but yeah, I, I wasn't really making a point about logic there. It was, it was just it, it, like specifically in in the moral case because. I don't know, with, with the logical case, it's like that seemed plausible. And I, I think I mentioned that, you know, I think I mentioned earlier that like, yeah, that's plausible. It seems just totally implausible when it comes to morality to me. Um, like on this point, I'm, I don't know, I, I don't think I am even willing to kind of grant it because I, I don't even see this as being uh, like the idea that we're going to get a substantive moral theory by like describing the subconscious architecture of the human mind. That seems... I, I don't know. I, I, I like that's yeah, absurd to you. Totally, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just don't accept that. No, no. I, I okay. No, no, no. That, that's fine. So, um, it, to me, in, to me instead, I don't know why. Uh, but to me instead, so if I, for example, take the principles of Sidwick and that basically spell out a kind of utilitarian consequentialist moral theory, it seems to me that I can. And this is going to be a very bold claim I'm about to make. It seems to me that I can kind of um, capture, uh, I don't know, 95% uh, of the way uh, humans have uh, historically and cross-culturally behaved uh, when creating their moral norms. Um, yeah. So this... Yeah, so... Uh, no, no, no. So, okay, so... <laughs> Not 95% utilitarian. Yeah. So. So. Okay. So. Okay, this uh, uh, prima facie. Uh, prima facie. That this seems very ambitious. But let me just say that. Um, so these first principles, of course, w when I say that we can capture. Okay. So may maybe I should. Uh, maybe I would go back on what I just said. You made me reflect uh, a bit. <laughs> no. No. So of course, w when I think about principles of logic or principles of uh, statistics that guide us, of course, um, we kind of stochastically obey them, as you were saying before. Um, even for the laws of logic, we make mistakes. We can be in self-contradiction with one another. We can be incoherent. Uh, for the laws of statistics, we can make mistaken inferences. So um, we can make mistakes. Uh, even, for example, if you grant the fact that these uh, I don't know, laws of logic uh, kind of govern our structure, uh, we can still make mistakes uh, descriptively while using them. So in the same sense, in the same sense, if we grant these principles uh, uh, that uh, Sidwick lays out, uh, it wouldn't be that we're perfectly matching on 
to a utilitarian uh, uh, normative theory. We, we, of course, we would be making mistakes when, we, when, as in the case of statistics or the laws of logic, there would be biases in this domain too. So we would be brought to um, uh, apply things in a way that don't um, uh, that are wrong. Uh, and I, of course, I'm paralleling, I'm paralleling from the laws of logic. So um, it's not that uh, it's a perfect uh, a perfect one to one match. But if we look at the rules that govern uh, different societies through time, uh, and uh, my, I don't know the arguments for moral convergence, it seems to me that we are mm, getting closer and closer to uh, yeah this kind of. Uh, Utilitarianism, that descriptively. Yeah, I, I think I think that the moral convergence arguments are really poor. Um, there are so many other ways of accounting for convergence, um, and it, it's like it, you know, I mean, you know, we, we live in a world which is increasingly kind of globalized. People are like mixing together. I, like obviously, there's going to be convergence, um, but like if we are talking about the kind of architecture that has been like sub that has been kind of instilled in us um subconsciously uh well i mean i i, I like i say you know the, the empirical evidence on this is you know uh like un unclear uh, at the moment but it looks like there's a very strong case for um some sort of like tribal preference uh, let's say like you know in group preference to be yeah. built into us right? yeah um so i w yeah, I mean, so that's not utilitarian. Yeah, um, and and not only is is there a strong case that that's been built into us, um, that seems to have manifested itself throughout pretty much every society all in human history. Um, yeah, and that's so I that seems to be utilitarian. Yeah, so I agree. So I have two things to say about that. So the first is that um, as for as as you were claiming before in our in our conversation, there's some. Um, there's some evolutionary, what we would call biases, even in the... Um, yeah, well, whoa, 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 wait, 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't get to call it a bias, because your claim is, right, your claim is that, these mor that the moral theory is supposed to be tracking our subconscious architecture, right? So it's like, like what, what... No, no, no but the, the principle... Bias, right, why isn't that just part of the architecture that our moral theory should be tracking? Well... Okay, so... I w I'm again would go back to the logical domain. So uh... no, 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 no. Let's not go back. No, right. I, okay, I can grant. Like, let's just grant the classical logic. I, I, I'll just grant that. Let's stick with this moral point. Like, I'm no, but no, but you grant. You grant that there are biases in the logical domain that we are evolutionarily brought to. I think that we that like what here's here's what I might be, like be able to. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't grant that, but I, I just want to stick to like I don't understand how you're going to claim that like in group preference has not evolved and or, or like well I mean I guess you want to say no no uh, no it has evolved yes yeah. right so it has evolved so like how is that not part of the subconscious architect I just well because not everything because it's yeah if this is the argument we keep getting stuck up on and i and i recognize that uh, it's hard um to me to spell out where the limits of uh, a theory the principles of a theory map onto us and and where they uh, uh and where instead uh, there's biases so um so maybe maybe one way to say descriptively i think there's a bias is that we can see that today descriptively at least these uh uh this tribalism, this, this tribalism has seemed to uh, um, has seemed to be always been expanding. So uh, it would be, so if if this was really a principle that was um, uh, deeply instilled uh, in us and that um, uh, yeah was one of the principles uh, we should account for. Um, it seems strange that today in in our world, uh, people are even thinking about expanding uh, uh, the tribal circle even to sentient beings. Um, it just seems descriptively. Uh, but if it, if it, if this was a constant, why is it why is these circles kind of expanding through time? Well, I I mean I don't think that it is a constant because I mean people are influenced by culture as well. I I wouldn't say that any. I don't think any moral principles are constants in that sense. I mean, um, but 
uh, yeah, I, I, I think that you can account for convergence um, in, in sort of purely, let's say, sociological terms. Like, there, you can look at the sort of changes that have occurred. I mean, if, if you imagine, like, two societies that are both, in, both completely separate, right, and maybe they have, like, different normative views, and then they start meeting each other, they start interacting, um, and they start, like, you know, sharing... <clears throat> food and uh, you know cultural products and you know they start sort of reasoning together uh, you would expect there to be a convergence in their moral views regardless of what's going on in terms of like the subconscious architecture or regardless of what the moral facts are or anything like that it's it, that's just a product of like the fact that you know they they're you know interacting and uh, uh, interacting with each other and so I think that there's explanation will apply to um, the apparent convergence that we see. I, I, I'm also kind of skeptical that, that there is really that much, you know, that, that I think sometimes people overstate the extent of convergence that has actually occurred. Um, I, I do wonder if, um, you know, like we, we live currently in a sort of, you know, liberal democracy where those sorts of utilitarian values are um, fairly strongly held. I mean, there's a lot of people who just you know, who, who reject utilitarianism as a moral theory, but like, I agree that, you know, we often evaluate things in terms of like promotion of, um, you know, like we care about like, uh, reducing suffering and promoting pleasure and, and that. So I, I guess you can see, see them as like broadly utilitarian values, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I can imagine the sort of world order changing, you know, I can imagine a future where, um, like, you know, I don't know, China becomes much more powerful and, and maybe our uh, moral thinking goes in a very different way. Um, like, I can see a future where liberal democracies decline in their power. And I imagine that the sort of moral theories that people accept would change as well. But maybe that's kind of beside the point because, you know... Okay, so... I don't know, I can't predict the future. No, no, okay. So maybe, <clears throat> maybe let me say another thing about uh, uh, tribalism. So tribalism... Um, in a way, it can be seen even as a utilitarian tendency. So, for instance, if we go back 2,000, 3,000 years and uh, we meet another tribe, we don't know which laws govern them. We don't know if they're uh, going to be more, um, if they're going to be aggressive. We don't know. Uh, um, so, yeah, just um, kind of piggybacking on what you were saying. Um, it seems like utilitarian principles, if we bring them back in time, there's a, there's a different environment that, um, so which they would, uh, uh, they would kind of map on to uh, uh, the descriptive ways that tribes formed a bit better, because these tribes are like saying, okay, we, we, we should care about these other tribes that are near us, but maybe we have limited resources, we have to make difficult decisions. Uh, maybe this tribe, uh, maybe we don't have resources to feed, uh, um, to feed both both groups, and so then uh, uh, utilitarian principles would uh, kind of uh, av avow some tribalism in a sense that uh, I have good reason to think that my tribe has a better rules or better norms than the next tribe, and because there's not enough resources for both. Um, Utilitarian. Uh, I have to do what's best for the overall good, and uh, I don't know even know how, know how many members are in the other tribe. So maybe uh, I should uh, kind of, um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I don't think that kind of thing really helps here because um, you know you're, you're sort of like. Uh, I mean, in, in a way, it's like kind of applying the utilitarian reasoning at sort of a higher level, right? So where it's kind of saying, well, like. You know the the sort of tribes that acted um, like ex sort of you know the kind of tribes that like acted without this uh, sort of in group preference. Um, well, they would end up sort of uh, being less successful, right? Because maybe they would encounter violent tribes or whatever, or maybe they'd be exploited or something like that. I mean, and that that may well be true, but um, that's not going to explain the cognitive architecture that humans actually evolved with in the kind of environment that you're describing what we would expect is that the cognitive architecture that humans evolved with is one that has in-group preference built into it um, because in-group preference is what promotes survival and reproduction 
And I, I think that that's, mm -hmm. that's, it seems pretty plausible that that's how humans did evolve. Um, because it seems pretty plausible that that is the kind of environment that people evolved in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, um, I just want to say, I can see you're making a strong point here because uh, I really can't disagree that evolutionary uh, history, um, it seems that survival we should uh, in kind of uh, kind of have some in-group preferences. It seems uh, very plausible and compelling. Uh, so yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, I, I won't go back to the bias argument. <laughs> um, well, no, okay. I, it may be worth exploring. I mean, like, uh, I, 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 I don't want to put you off it, you know? Um, <laughs> Um, no, no, it's just that I don't feel it. I don't feel I'm, I'm equipped to really make um, any better argument right now towards that because um, you do make some good points about it and I'm going to think about it better and maybe I'll reject what I'm now holding. I maybe just need some time to recognize uh, the points you made. Um, so, yeah, so, so right now, of course, I, I can't... Um, I would have to try. I would have to try to find a way to distinguish biases in some domains with biases with what we mean by these two things, and it kind of seems foggy to me. Um, I, it's something that I haven't thought of. So, so first of all, I'm glad you brought it up because you're um, you're kind of making me think about something I uh, I haven't thought of. So that's important, uh, at least for my for, for myself. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure I could do a better job at arguing for for why we have biases in um, yeah. So 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 for why I would think that there's evolutionary biases um, in some domain and why they would uh, translate to the moral one. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's I would say. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I I mean, you know, I'm. Um... I hear that there's something for you to think about. I, I'm glad I could help, <laughs> I, I guess, yeah. in some sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, so actually, thank yeah. you, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, thanks for, you know, uh, in inviting me. I mean, was that was that all you wanted to talk about then? Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm very happy. I'm very happy with this. Let, let me just uh, bring, a, uh, let me just bring an objection that I thought you were going to bring, but you didn't, um, that I think is quite strong, actually to what I'm saying. And I, uh, it's the, the Zorpian example, the alien, yeah. the alien example. Because, and this would be an argument for moral disagreement. Um, so, so according to my view, uh, let's say there was an alien race that developed evolutionarily in a very different way than us and it came to earth and it, and they were mapping onto these other moral, uh, uh, this other, this other cognitive architecture for morality, um, we, it doesn't seem like we could resolve this uh, disagreement. Uh, it, given my definition, given my definition of morality, of my naturalist definition, it doesn't seem we could resolve the disagreement in any way. And uh, yeah, of course, now I have to answer my own question because <laughs> you're not going to help me answer this. <laughs> so. Um, no, I, I, I just felt that this was another objection that um, uh, I kind of see the strength to. Um, I'm not sure if the other, if the other alien race could exist. So maybe there could be an argument. To, maybe it could be an argument where we say that um, it's just that we uh, every organism develops uh, every organism capable of uh, self reasoning or self um, self reflection. Um, develops in uh, the same way regarding these moral principles. So this disagreement just doesn't occur. What would you say to that? I, 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 I mean, you can postulate that if you want. I, I don't see any reason to believe it, but okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, it, no, but uh, I, okay. I, I just, so, I so, so how do we, how do we, how do we evaluate that? Okay. So, 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 so maybe you um, only have one example of, uh, organisms that have um, like developed the ability to reflect right so we would have to uh, have other examples in order to start making claims about like how hmm. you know what, what are the principles that like govern the evolution of um, kind of self-reflective consciousness um, 
Yeah, so, so maybe let me argue. Let me argue for what I just said a bit. So, um, uh, all, all the other organisms um, we see, of course, they're not capable of of, of self reflection like us. But it does seem like there there is some structural value um, in them, at least. So, for example, a dog values, I don't know, um, so food. He values reproduction. Um, and uh, uh, if we were to give the ability, uh, so and, and and all organisms that kind of um, all organisms seem to develop in a way that at a certain point they experience suffering. So they can experience suffering at a certain point. Um, and this is a point that where it seems like it gets us close. It gets us. It gets us closer to self reflection. And uh, I don't know, like, of course, this is no proof of anything, but if I were to give self-reflection to, let's say, a dog, um, it seems to me that he might uh, map onto uh, principles that maybe we care of too. So maybe one that I was talking about before is like, unnecessary suffering is bad. It seems like he might agree that unnecessary suffering is bad, even if he can't arrive there yet because he's not a self-reflection creature. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess, uh, I'm not sure then, so th would this be an expression of what you take its, its subconscious uh, beliefs to be? Like yeah. when we were imagining giving it reflection? Yeah, you can... The idea is that that's, the unnecessary suffering is bad is built into the subconscious architecture and then that influences its conscious beliefs. Yeah, yeah, so uh, of course right. I, I don't kind of... I'm kind of iffy on the subconscious word, so I would say subconscious, conscious. Uh, okay, but you, you acknowledge that, yeah. So yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the the reason I ask that is because you know that like there's another way of like running this, which is well, like once you have reflected consciousness, um, you can kind of start getting certain like you know moral facts from that. But yeah, I just it didn't seem like that was the kind of line you, that you were gonna. That was the kind of view you were making there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, look, it, it seems to me that when I look at different species, I would expect their evaluative attitudes to be radically different from ours. Um, now, there's 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 a sort of way of accounting for that within the sort of framework of like universal moral principles, where we can say, well, it's because those species have. Um, you know, it's it's because those species like live in different circumstances and they have different, uh, like literally different biological constitutions. Um, you know, like uh, obviously in a species where the means of reproduction is completely different. Um, uh, you know, like like we, uh, oh, you know, there's the distinction between like R strategists and K strategists. You know, so it's, it turns out like humans have to invest a lot of time into raising their young, whereas. Um, in other species, that's not the case. Like rabbits don't have to do that because they just produce so many young. So, uh, you know, like given these different biological constitutions, the same universal moral principles um, might end up producing different, uh, what seem to be different moral views. Um, so, I mean, you can always kind of make that sort of argument. But then it, I would have thought that if we're talking about the sort of the subconscious architecture um <laughs> the sort of evaluative attitudes that uh species have evolved with i would have thought there would just be a difference there um so but you know i i i, I don't know <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of agnostic on this sort of stuff yeah yeah okay okay um so no nothing i uh, so thank you for entertaining me and uh, for making me think and uh, love your YouTube uh, videos and everything, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for, you know, uh, inviting me to have this uh, conversation. Yeah, yeah that, that seems fair enough. <laughs>